Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. The CDC and FDA are calling for a pause on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine after rare cases of blood clots. We speak to a doctor who explains what could be going on. 18 Republican senators are calling for the FBI to investigate President Joe Biden's top Pentagon pick for allegedly disclosing classified information when he served in the Obama administration. New secretly recorded footage of a CNN employee is released by Project Veritas. The employee details the network's alleged plan to support President Biden's campaign and get former President Trump out of office. The U.S. murder rate reaches a record high since over two decades. In some major cities, the rate rose by over 30 percent over the past year. Protests are up in Minnesota and Portland following the police-involved death of Dante Wright. But the officer who shot him isn't in the force anymore. America's top health agencies called on doctors to pause their use of J&J's vaccine. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on what happened and the rare blood disorder in question. So far, nearly 7 million people have been given a dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. But the CDC and FDA are recommending a pause. They say six cases of rare and severe types of blood clots after vaccination triggered their sensors. The White House's COVID-19 response team says Americans will be fine. There are plenty of Pfizer and Moderna vaccine to go around. We're now working with our state and federal partners to get anyone scheduled for a J&J &J vaccine quickly rescheduled for a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. Only women between the ages of 18 and 48 experienced the blood clots mixed with low levels of blood platelets. One case was fatal and one patient is in critical condition. In light of what's happened, J&J &J says they paused their European rollout for now. Some, including former President Trump, are criticizing the CDC and FDA's call for a pause, considering that only six people experienced this problem. Pulmonologist Dr. Roger Schultz believes the government made the right call. It's because we are vaccinating so many people, and so even one in a million is going to be a lot of people when you're vaccinating that many people. Number two is that the clots that are being formed in these type of situations with the low platelets is a, is a different type of blood clot than we normally see and treat. And so I believe physicians need to be alert to that. So when they see somebody with blood clots and low platelets, realize that they have to treat that differently. The CDC says doctors should not use heparin, a blood thinner, if they find this combination of adverse reactions in a patient because it may be dangerous. Schultz says doctors should check for low platelets if they find blood clots. So regardless of what the CDC and FDA say, Generally, doctors should already know to avoid heparin if their patients have blood clots mixed with low platelet levels. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Dr. Fauci said the pause on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will allow scientists to investigate what's going on, but the pause will only last days to weeks. A group of Republican senators are calling for the FBI to probe Biden's top Pentagon pick. They want an investigation to reveal whether Colin Call improperly disclosed classified information when he served as Biden's national security advisor during the Obama administration. 18 senators led by Bill Haggerty and Tom Cotton are asking the FBI to investigate Biden's nominee for Secretary of Defense for Policy, Colin Call. They're also asking Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to hold off on advancing Call's nomination until the FBI completes an investigation. Call served under Biden when he was vice president, and the senators are accusing Call of repeatedly publicizing classified information and controlled unclassified information he received from U.S. national security officials. One example they give is Call's tweet on December 20th, 2017. There's a contingent at the White House that believes a limited strike is viable and the U.S. can control escalation by threatening a regime change if Kim Jong-un retaliates. And I've heard this separately from multiple sources inside the administration. This raises alarm bells for the GOP senators, saying that by publicly sharing internal military plans and deliberations, Call appears to have exposed U.S. national security interests. 
In their letter to FBI Director Ray and Senator Schumer, the senators assert that the position calls being nominated for takes a person of sound judgment. But if it does turn out that he mishandled uh, classified information for partisan purposes to attack Trump administration officials, I think this nomination will be done. They say Call's growing record of apparent mishandling of classified information and controlled unclassified information and his evasive response regarding the issue falls short of the standard required for holding one of our nation's top national security positions. President Joe Biden is reportedly withdrawing all U.S. troops from Afghanistan by September 11th, the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. This is according to several U.S. officials. Press Secretary Jen Psaki says Biden will reveal his plans in a speech tomorrow. Uh, the president will deliver remarks tomorrow at the White House on the way forward in Afghanistan, including his plans and timeline for withdrawing U.S. troops in close coordination with our partners and allies and the government of Afghanistan and his commitment to focusing on the threats and opportunities we face around the world today. If Biden confirms the September 11th timeline, his decision would defy a peace agreement the Trump administration reached with the Taliban in 2020. The agreement stated May 1st as the deadline for all troops to be withdrawn from Afghanistan. And while troops are withdrawing from Afghanistan, more are being deployed elsewhere. Today, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said hundreds of additional troops will be stationed in Germany as early as this fall. This is another reversal of Trump-era policy. During his term, Trump sought to have 12,000 troops removed from the country, saying Germany has been delinquent in its payments to NATO. And the nation's highest lawmakers gathered at the U.S. Capitol to show their respect for a fallen policeman. He died in the line of duty while protecting the nation's capital. President Biden and other lawmakers paid tribute to fallen U.S. Capitol Officer Billy Evans. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer also attended the ceremony. Officer Evans was killed after 25-year-old suspect Noah Green rammed his vehicle into Evans and another officer before crashing into the northern barricade of the Capitol on April 2nd. Another Capitol policeman was also injured in the attack. Green was later killed by police. Noah Green was a follower of the Nation of Islam. The group said they were saddened by the loss of someone with such great potential, but condemned the violent attack. President Biden spoke at the memorial service and consoled the officer's wife, who was sitting in the front row with her mother and two children. My prayer for all of you is that uh, the day will come when you have that memory. And I said, just smile before you bring a tear to your eyes. Evans' family said in a statement he was the best father, son, brother, and friend anyone could hope for. This incident has reopened the debate of increasing security and keeping a fence around the Capitol's perimeter. Nancy Pelosi told CBS that a new Capitol security funding bill is just about ready. Jason Perry, NTD News. The officer who shot Dante Wright at a traffic stop on Sunday has resigned, and the city's police chief did the same. This comes after protests broke out in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, and Portland, Oregon. NTD's Kevin Hogan has more. The 26-year-old veteran police officer Kim Potter and the Brooklyn Center police chief Tim Gannon resigned on Tuesday. This comes two days after Potter shot 20-year-old Dante Wright during a traffic stop and allegedly killed him. According to the St. Paul Pioneer Press, Potter said her departure was in the best interest of the community. Gannon said the shooting was an accidental discharge and that Potter meant to use her taser. The shooting led to police being deployed in riot gear and forming a line between protesters in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Officers were armed with batons and face shields. They stood their ground as the crowd voiced outrage over Sunday's police shooting. As the night fell, police stood guard on the roof of the police station, and when darkness set in, officers used flashbangs and tear gas to disperse crowds. At one point, a tear gas canister flew directly into a crowd of protesters who then dispersed. And in Portland, Oregon, people took to the streets to protest Wright's death. The police chased them, knocking down protesters. Police moved in on protesters running past fires that were in the middle of the street. Local media said about 200 protesters gathered in front of a building that houses multiple law enforcement agencies. 
Kevin Hogan, NTD News. The City Council of Brooklyn Center voted out their city manager. That's right after the manager said the officer deserved due process. The council called for an emergency meeting where they made the decision. In 2020, the U.S. saw the largest one-year increase in murders. After looking at FBI data, experts believe the past year is the most violent since 1998. NTD's Allison Lee has more details on the crime rates. According to the FBI's quarterly uniform crime report, the murder rate in cities of all sizes rose by at least 20 percent from January to December 2020. The nation reported over 20,000 homicides, making it the largest one-year increase in history. The FBI report is based on data from close to 13,000 or 70 percent of the country's law enforcement agencies. Cities with over a million people reported the largest rise in murders, a whopping 32 percent. In New York City, that figure is roughly 41 percent, and in Chicago, that figure is over 50 percent. Cities with 500,000 to a million people saw a nearly 27 percent increase. Even cities with less than 10,000 people saw an average increase of close to 25 percent. When it comes to arson, the data is even more striking. Cities with over a million people saw a 57 percent increase in arson last year. Overall, the nation saw a 24 percent increase. Rape and robbery, on the other hand, dropped noticeably in the country, both by over 10 percent. The increase in overall violent crime in 2020 is at 3.3 percent. This despite the figures having declined in previous years. Statistician and crime analyst Jeff Asher tells the Washington Examiner this set of data puts the murder rate of 2020 at roughly 6.22 per 100,000, making it the highest since 1998. Figures from 2019 and 2018 were both lower. Manhattan Institute's Charles Lehman says he believes the rise in crimes relates to anti-police sentiments and movements. He tells the Washington Examiner these spikes in murder are unsurprisingly associated with hostility towards the police and a retreat of police from public life. Allison Lee, NTD News. A lawyer in Delaware is fighting for the rights of her fellow residents one lawsuit at a time. She sued the governor over virus restrictions and rental bans. Now she's pushing against new gun laws. NTD's Don Tran has the details. Delaware attorney Julian Murray is challenging the state's government to multiple legal battles. So, you know, so I sort of have a, we'll call it a reputation as, you know, as someone that will file in federal court and is, um, has a very strong opinion about COVID restrictions. Recently, Murray filed a lawsuit on behalf of Delawareans over the state holding its General Assemblies virtually rather than in person. She argues officials are violating the constitutional right to assemble. She says people need to participate in hearings meaningfully, and that requires being there in person. You know, this is a huge issue. It's a fundamental right. The public needs to be able to uh, to be involved in that. And, you, and when you have a republic, power flows from the people. So Her latest legal challenge is over new gun laws. One of the laws requires a permit process, a move that Murray says restricts the wrong people. It unfortunately impacts, and the, the rally yesterday was, was women, you know, women who already are financially, you know, maybe a single parent or something like that are now looking at hundreds of dollars for the classes and the background investigation and all the stuff that has to happen when there's no statistic about the law-abiding citizens doing stuff that's unlawful. Regardless of whether the gun laws stay, Murray says she believes the best way to reduce gun-related crimes is to prosecute them to the full extent of the law. Don Tran, NTD News. Undercover journalism nonprofit Project Veritas has just released new secretly recorded footage. The footage shows a CNN employee crediting the network for getting Trump out of office. And talking about CNN's new focus now that COVID stories are becoming fatigued. James O'Keefe's Project Veritas has released a new secretly recorded footage showing CNN technical director Charlie Chester detailing how the network worked to support President Biden during his 2020 election campaign. We would always share shots of him jogging yeah. and that I'm healthy, you know, blah, blah, blah. And him in aviator shades and like, as, like you paint him as a young geriatric. 
The montage of undercover clips were taken on several different occasions, and as with any clipped sound bites, the final product should be approached with caution. However, this video does show a number of Chester's complete sentences, making misleading editing tricks unlikely. In the video, Chester credits CNN for getting President Trump voted out of office, and says that's why he came to work at CNN. He also admits the stories CNN ran about Trump's health amount to propaganda. Like when Trump uh, was, uh, I, I don't know, like his hand was shaking or whatever like that, we brought in like so many medical people to like all tell a story that like it was all speculation that he was like neurological damage, like that, that he was losing it, he's unfit to, you know, whatever. We were, we were creating a story there that we didn't know anything about, you know, we were, so that's, that's, I think that's probably end up. The CNN employee said getting Trump out of office was CNN's focus. But now, he says, CNN has another focus, climate change. Chester indicated that the public is getting tired of virus-related stories and said climate change is going to be the next COVID. So it's going to be our focus. Like, uh, like our, our focus was to get Trump out of office, right? Without saying it, that's what it was, right? So our next thing is going to be for climate change. He said this decision came from the head of the network and that it's already been announced to employees. As technical director, Chester wouldn't have input on show content and he was likely not included in editorial meetings. However, in a statement to Mediate, O'Keefe said, as a technical director, Charlie Chester is fully involved in the day-to-day -day operations of CNN's newsroom. He is witness to decisions being made and who they are coming from. He has full access to the culture within the network and explains on video how company-wide directives are being implemented. O'Keefe says this video is only part one, indicating there's more to come. U.S. lawmakers are condemning the April 12th attack on the Epic Times print shop in Hong Kong. Today, the newspaper provided more details about the incident. This afternoon in Washington, D.C., the director of the Epic Times Hong Kong edition gave new details on the attack. As soon as the attackers barged into the printing plant, they threatened the staff, telling them not to do anything that would force the attackers to take action. They caused extensive damage to the printing equipment. The printing press control panel sustained the most severe damage, while the transmitter, several computers and a CPU were also destroyed. The Epic Times also released footage that shows four masked men breaking into the printing house. They smashed computers and printing machinery and threw concrete rubble onto the printing equipment. Guo Jun said the attack is not an isolated incident. This attack is not an isolated incident. It's the fifth time since its establishment in 2006 that criminals have targeted the printing press. Since last October, staff at the printing press have been monitored and followed by unknown vehicles. She says the same facility was attacked in November 2019. That's when four masked men broke in and set fire to the building. There was also another attack back in October 2012. Thugs tried to smash open the gate to the facility. Two months later, seven men carrying toolboxes attempted to break into the facility, but fled after being discovered by security guards. Founded in the United States in 2000, the Epic Times began publishing in Hong Kong in 2001. The Chinese Communist Party has used every trick in the book to suppress the Epic Times in Hong Kong in an attempt to prevent the city's people from getting independent news. The Epic Times is one of the few remaining voices in the Hong Kong media landscape that does not bend to the CCP. The attack on free press has gained increasing attention from U.S. lawmakers. The director thanked the international community for its support. She said Hong Kong Epic Times will never bow to the Chinese Communist Party and will continue reporting the truth. The Hong Kong Epic Times office has suspended its printing operations due to the damage. But Guo Jun says staff are in the process of repairing the equipment. She expects to start printing again by April 16th. This incident has gained increasing attention from politicians in the U.S. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said in a statement, the attack on the Epic Times and on the free press in Hong Kong is appalling, but not unexpected. He said the Chinese Communist Party continues to demonstrate they will not honor their agreement on the freedom of the people of Hong Kong. And meanwhile, the U.S. State Department has also condemned the attack on the printing press and urged Hong Kong authorities to thoroughly investigate and bring the perpetrators to justice. 
And UK and EU politicians and organizations also condemn the attack on the Epic Times printing press in Hong Kong. Members of the UK Parliament's upper house responded to the news of the attack on one of Hong Kong's independent media. Lord Hunt of King's Heath said he was very shocked to hear this. The Epoch Times is an amazing independent media outlet in Hong Kong, fearless and standing up for a free press and human rights. May its voice never be silenced. Lord Alton of Liverpool said, Those who become enemies of freedom of speech, who smash up printing presses or threaten journalists, have no respect for human rights and show their fear of truth. Paradoxically, their use of violence, intimidation and brute force reveals their weakness and the nature of their ideology. And Baroness Kennedy of the Shores said, Freedom of the press is fundamental to a democracy. Crushing the media and independent journalism is a way to deny citizens information about abuses of power and about the loss of their rights. Wrecking computers and printing equipment is the act of those who despise democracy. London-based writer and human rights activist, who is also the chief executive and co-founder of Hong Kong Watch, Benedict Rogers, commented that This attack on the Epoch Times is yet another deplorable example of increasing threats to media freedom and freedom of expression in Hong Kong and should be condemned unequivocally. An international cross-party group of lawmakers, the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, said The freedom of press is an absolute requirement in any state that respects the rule of law. If the Hong Kong authorities really were independent champions of their democratic system, they'd defend the Epoch Times. Hong Kong has slipped into the grips of an authoritarian communist party that will tolerate no criticism. Up next, New York City is giving out vaccines at record speed, but new virus variants are concerning city officials. And sales at the Union Square market in New York City look more promising than ever since the start of pandemic lockdowns, especially for produce and honey. That and more on NTD News. Most of the CCP virus cases in New York City are new variants of the virus. NTD's P Arian Pazdar asks an expert what this means for the fight against the virus. As much as 70% of all new cases in the city are new variants. Some of those are the well-known UK or Brazilian variant. But the most prevalent one was first discovered in Washington Heights. City officials are calling it the Washington Heights variant. Now all of those new variants have different categorizations. For example, the Washington Heights variant is called a variant of interest by the CDC because it spreads faster than the original strain. But the UK variant, on the other hand, not only spreads faster, but it also causes more severe symptoms, so it's a variant of concern. Viruses are always evolving, so the prevalence of new variants is no surprise. These COVID viruses are going to be around, just like flu viruses, and we're always going to get some modification or different components of this. New York is trying to get ahead of those variants. So the state is vaccinating everyone over 16 years of age now. According to Dr. Samadi, we should go back to only vaccinating the vulnerable population. And if you just randomly talk about that everybody out there should get vaccinated, including children, then what do you need any science or data or research for? According to a new report from the city, New York will continue studying the Washington Heights variant to see if it poses a significant threat. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. New York City taxi drivers need to buy medallions from the government in order to do their jobs. But drivers are suing, saying the government artificially inflated medallion prices as Uber and Lyft devastated their industry. NTD's Colin Fredrickson reports. Two taxi drivers have filed a $2.56 billion lawsuit accusing New York City officials of artificially inflating the value of its taxi medallions by fraudulent, collusive and deceptive means in order to maximize its own profits. No. State Senator Tim Kennedy discussed the situation last month. New York City medallions were worth in the past over a million dollars. Today, Many of those are valued at under $200,000, leaving these medallion owners who are often immigrants with hefty debt that they can't repay. The medallions give drivers the right to pick up customers. Former president and current spokesman of the New York State Federation of Taxi Drivers, Fernando Mateo, applauds the suit. So the person who sold it to them 
should take them back and give them their money back and sell them at today's price. That's what's fair. The plaintiffs claim New York City earned approximately $855 million from high-priced medallion sales, knowing full well that Uber and Lyft made them far less valuable. Drivers can't afford to lose their livelihood, to lose everything that they've saved in their life for and everything that they've worked for. So shame on New York City for taking the cab drivers on a ride. Mayor de Blasio has taken action to address the situation, setting up a relief fund and giving out $20,000 loans. So they can end up in a better situation for their future and for their family's future. Mateo, who is running for mayor, says this is not enough. It's a slap in the face to hear what he is offering these drivers. It's adding insult to injury. You don't do that. If I am mayor, when I am mayor, I will make sure that these drivers get their money back. The plaintiff's lawyer says the city owes medallion owners three times the $855 million revenue, according to federal racketeering law. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. Things are looking up for New Yorkers who grow their own veggies. Sales are improving month by month. High above the loud New York City streets, a man tends to his beehives on top of a 38-story building in Manhattan. Andrew Cote is the founder of Andrew's Honey and owns over 60 beehives on rooftops all over New York City. When people enjoy Andrew's Honey, I want them just to enjoy the, the taste and the experience and that little time capsule of what was in bloom in New York at that time. At the Union Square Green Market, Coates said that in late March, he saw the best sales day in 13 months. But it was a low bar, uh, you know, because over the last year, it's been, it's been very slow. The manager of Norwick Meadows Farm spoke about the importance of getting out and supporting the community. I hope it's not enough. People need to, like, you know, come out and do the right thing, you know. I know you have to follow the uh, safety features, whatever the rules are. But I think it's important for them to come out and work and eat good, most importantly, and support each other. And the executive director at Union Square Partnership said that the Union Square district has suffered through the pandemic, but the green market is the number one foot traffic driver in the neighborhood. They have a very loyal following, and so I think it helped to allow the neighborhood to have this feeling that things were still a little bit normal while the crisis was going on. Falk said 33 businesses have opened or plan to open in the district since January 2020. Before the pandemic, she said 40 new businesses would open in the Union Square district each year. San Francisco plans to pilot a drug sobering center. They say its 24-hour facility can help lower drug addiction and overdoses and aid recovery. And a former California mayor has been arrested for alleged sexual assault against a minor. 13 miles away, another mayor is also facing allegations of sexual assault. That and more on NTD News. Do you have a life insurance policy you no longer need? Now you can sell your policy, even a term policy, for an immediate cash payment. Call Coventry Direct to learn more. We thought we had planned carefully for our retirement. But we quickly realized we needed a way to supplement our income. Our friends sold their policy to help pay their medical bills. And that got me thinking. Maybe selling our policy could help with our retirement. I was skeptical. So I did some research and called Coventry Direct. They explained life insurance is a valuable asset that can be sold. We learned we could sell all of our policy or keep part of it with no future payments. Who knew? We sold our policy. Now we can relax and enjoy our retirement as we had planned. If you have $100,000 or more of life insurance, you may qualify to sell your policy. Don't cancel or let your policy lapse without finding out what it's worth. Visit CoventryDirect.com to find out if your policy qualifies or call 1-800-509-8500. Coventry Direct, redefining insurance. 90% of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epic Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. This is a battle. 
a battle between truth and deceit. Subscribe today and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. San Francisco officials say they plan to open a sobering center as part of a pilot program. The center would allow people to sober up while intoxicated with drugs. San Francisco Mayor London Breed announced a lease for a drug sobering center on Howard Street. It's for people intoxicated from fentanyl, meth and other drugs. According to Tuesday's press release, the center is meant to prevent overdose deaths and reduce danger to the surrounding neighborhood and to give people who use drugs and an alternative to hospital and jail stays. Breed will propose the building lease to the city's board of supervisors. The facility will initially be able to serve up to 20 people at a time, operating 24-7. People may stay an average of 8 to 10 hours each. Healthcare and safety workers will staff the program. According to the San Francisco Chronicle, the project would cost $2 million in one-time expenses and $4.2 million to operate annually. If the city's Board of Supervisors approves the building lease, the pilot program could be implemented this fall. Two California leaders are facing sexual assault allegations. One is a former mayor who has been arrested without bail. The other is a current mayor facing recalls by local residents. NTD's David Lamb has the story. On Saturday, police officers arrested former Sebastopol Mayor Robert Jacob and took him into custody without bail. Jacob is facing an investigation of five felonies, including distribution of child pornography and one misdemeanor sexual assault crime against a minor. According to Sebastopol Police Chief Kevin Gilgore, the alleged assaults occurred between December 2019 and March 2021. Jacob was the CEO of two large marijuana dispensaries in California and was the first marijuana business executive elected as a U.S. mayor in 2013. His career even earned him the nickname the cannabis mayor in the industry. The current mayor of Sebastopol, Una Glass, called the arrest of his predecessor extremely disappointing. And just miles away, Windsor's mayor Dominic Fapoli is also facing allegations of sexual assault from six women, including a French intern at his family-owned winery. One of the allegations dates back to 2003. But Fapoli has denied all accusations and called them political and social machinations. Local residents and officials are campaigning to recall Fapoli. Two California representatives called on Fapoli to resign and say the allegations suggest a pattern of predatory behavior. His chief political ally, Council Mayor Deborah Fudge, also called for his removal. The state's attorney general will oversee the investigation into Fapoli. David Lamb, NTD News, California. One of California's largest counties plans to test a digital vaccine passport program. It's set to launch later this month. NTD's Tom Ojimek has the details. California's Orange County plans to launch a pilot program for digital CCP virus vaccine and testing passports. Orange County health officials said the vaccine passport trial will roll out sometime in April. It can be used to display proof of vaccination when taking part in activities like concerts, sporting events, schools and travel. Details are scant about how the digital passport will work. But an Orange County health official said the county's existing Athena vaccine scheduling app could be modified to include a passport feature. The Athena app is being used to schedule vaccine appointments at the county's mass inoculation sites, including at Disneyland. The announcement comes amid controversy over vaccine passport-style systems. Civil liberties groups say vaccine passports could potentially violate Americans' privacy rights while denying key services to people who are not vaccinated. A number of Republican governors, including in Florida and Texas, have signed executive orders banning the use of vaccine passports. 
The Biden administration has said that it would not develop a federal vaccine passport system, but that it would formulate guidelines on their use, including around privacy. Tom Ozimek, NTD News. Coming up, the U.S. Navy took a photograph of a Chinese aircraft carrier in the East China Sea. The reason? Apparently to warn China that the U.S. is watching. And an unusual highway exit in southern China. Traffic cameras there have fined over half a million drivers a combined $20 million. Find out more in a moment on NTD News. China's aggression towards Taiwan continues to increase as a record-breaking 25 Chinese military jets entered Taiwan's air zone. Meanwhile, in the East China Sea, the U.S. Navy sent a message that they are keeping an eye on Chinese activity. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more. In its largest air incursion to date, China's aggression towards Taiwan shows no sign of easing. On Monday, a record-breaking 25 Chinese military aircraft entered the island's airspace. Taiwan's defense ministry reported fighter jets and nuclear-capable bombers among the planes in the incursion. As part of its One China policy, Beijing claims Taiwan as part of its own territory. It has not shied away from the possibility of unifying the island with mainland China by force. The unparalleled incursion comes after new U.S.-Taiwan policies. On Friday, the U.S. State Department issued fresh guidelines that will enable American officials to meet more freely with their Taiwanese counterparts. In light of the guidelines, China's foreign ministry issued a stern warning on Tuesday. The ministry spokesman told the U.S. to grasp the weight of the situation in regards to Taiwan and warned the White House not to play with fire. He went as far as to call the One China policy the foundation of U.S.-China relations. China's incursion into Taiwan also came despite a warning from the U.S. just one day prior. On Sunday, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken warned that it would be a serious mistake for China to change the status quo in reference to Taiwan. The U.S. has released a bold photo message to China, seemingly warning the country's navy not to step out of line. Over the weekend, the U.S. published a photo showing that the U.S. Navy is keeping an eye on a Chinese aircraft carrier. The image was taken last week, somewhere in the East China Sea. It captures a U.S. guided missile destroyer, the USS Mustin, just a few thousand yards or meters away from Chinese aircraft carrier Liaoning. Analysts say the photo was designed to send a clear message to Beijing. The USS Mustin's commander, Briggs, is seen relaxing with his feet up, with his deputy sitting beside him, both watching the Chinese Liaoning ship. A former Taiwan's Naval Academy instructor called the staged photo cognitive warfare, adding that the image means the U.S. isn't taking Chinese aggression lightly. A professional photographer notices the commander Briggs is using a Steiner telescope in the photo. On the scope, the company's logo, Nothing Escapes You, is visible. China reacted quickly to the message. The Chinese Communist Party's media mouthpiece released a video showing Navy live fire drills. The video explained that intensive Navy training is being conducted across three major war zones in China. The chief editor of a Chinese state-run newspaper, Hu Xijing, posted an update soon after on Chinese social media platform Weibo. He boasted that the Chinese regime would drive U.S. troops over 900 miles offshore during war. In some regions, traffic cameras have become a new tool for authorities to make money. One highway intersection in South China has already collected around $20 million in fines. An unusually high number of traffic violations have clocked in at one intersection in southern China. It's located in Guangdong province, and around 620,000 people have been fined there. Altogether, drivers have paid nearly $20 million in fines at that one intersection. Taking notice of the frequent violations, one person set up a drone nearby to find out what's going on. They discovered that in just three minutes, 27 drivers violated a traffic rule there. Local newspaper Nanfang Daily reported that a man named Mr. Yuan got a ticket there for running the solid road line. While paying the ticket, he noticed in the payment system that over 620,000 people have violated that rule at the same place. Each rule break leads to a $30 fine and a loss of three safe driving points. Mr. Yuan soon posted his discovery online, which triggered heated discussion. 
Many pointed out there's no sign ahead of the intersection to tell drivers to change lanes in advance. As a result, it's very easy to unknowingly violate the rule. But the police department claims the markings and signs on the road section have passed all acceptance checks. One driver pointed out online that there are many intersections with similar issues across the country. He wrote, nothing is more profitable than this business. Nobody knows how much money they get from it every day. According to China's official road statistics, over $45 billion in fines were doled out just last year. As of the end of 2020, there were around 280 million civilian vehicles on the road in the country. That means an average fine of more than $150 a year per vehicle. Coming up, to celebrate National Scrabble Day and easing of lockdowns in the UK, the game put on a colorful light show in London. And a French school that trains flight attendants sees enrollments drop amid pandemic-driven blows to the air travel industry. Find out more here on NTD News. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast, cable, or print media, has become extremely biased. And I started looking online for alternative ways to, to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times. I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff. I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epic Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. Over to Europe. It's National Scrabble Day in England. The game put on a colorful light show in London to celebrate with words that reflect the mood of the British people. Some of Britain's favorite words were projected onto buildings around London. They marked the easing of lockdown restrictions and National Scrabble Day on Tuesday. Words like freedom, hope, family, reunion and beer represent the mood of the nation. They were beamed in the style of the game's letter tiles onto a pub, shops, and special places like Harrods Department Store and the Shard Skyscraper. Scrabble commissioned a survey to find the words that best sum up people's feelings as months of lockdown eased on Monday. The most powerful word in there for me is reunion. Um, we've all been apart from each other. Um, friends, loved ones, um, colleagues <laughs> who are also loved ones, I suppose, <laughs> in some cases. Um, and really looking forward to getting back to my friends and family that I haven't seen for a long time and imagine a lot of the British public are too. The game that would eventually be called Scrabble was invented in New York by Alfred Mosher Butts, an architect during the Depression. National Scrabble Day is celebrated on his birthday. The game is played in more than 120 countries in 33 languages. Scrabble said lockdown had boosted sales of the game in Britain by more than 50% in 2020. And with restaurants and pubs reopening this week in the UK, people are taking the opportunity to enjoy a drink outside with friends. People gathered around pints of beer and glasses of wine as the sun set in London on Monday. It's everyone's first drink in a pub in over three months. Sitting by the River Thames, unfazed by the cold, clients say they're delighted to meet and drink together. The government just eased restrictions, allowing pubs and restaurants to serve small groups outdoors. It's going really well. We're drinking a beer at this bar in London and it's great. It's good to see people. Everyone is happy. Everyone is really content. Even if, it's, even if it was snowing, we'd still be here yeah, right we now. Would be. Yeah, it's just so nice to see everyone again. Shops and hairdressers were also allowed to open on Monday. British businesses are starting to shake off the pandemic and return to growth after a disastrous year. The hospitality sector has been among the worst hit. The aviation sector is in tatters due to the pandemic. 
French, young French people are turning away from flights, crew schools, and ground staff training. But some still hope for takeoff once things go back to normal. Aviation is in tatters, with travel ground to a halt, and France's potential future flight staff have taken note. The country's youth are turning away from flight crew schools and ground staff training in droves, many seeking employment elsewhere. 25-year-old student Clarisse Granville is concerned that when she finishes her training, there will be no work for her. My first question was, is it really worth it to enrol? Since there are less flights and there were many layoffs, notably with Air France, which is what we hear of most. Flight attendant of 40 years turned trainer Katrine Tastavan says registration has fallen by around 75% at her Paris-based flight school. Two years ago, we had a lot of registrations requests. A lot of young people were called to see if they can do the training. We had a training almost every month, every two months. The International Civil Aviation Organization estimates that total passenger traffic drops by 60% worldwide in the last year. French national carrier Air France suffered a 7.1 billion euro loss. That's 8.42 billion US dollars in the same year. They are to lay off some 8,500 employees by the end of 2022. Aeronautics giant Airbus also announced a slew of redundancies for France alone. Trainee Iris Charbonnel is hopeful, but says she will have to think of an alternative if she can't find work. I think that there have been numerous crises in the aviation sector and we always manage to get back on our feet. So there is still hope. And if I do not manage to find work right after my training, I would like to pass my private pilot license in order to stay in the field and progress at my own pace. Global passenger traffic numbers aren't expected to reach their previous levels before 2024, according to the IATA. But Tastavan remains optimistic for her students. She is sure there will be work available for the next generation of flight attendants and that younger and perhaps less costly staff will gradually replace older crew as the health situation returns to normal. Still to come, mud bubbles could hold the key to knowing what's next for Europe's tallest active volcano. An expert says the bubbles act like hints. And a conservation effort for the European bison is underway in Ukraine. It's helping the animals make a comeback from near extinction. Stay tuned to NTD News. Fountains of lava from a volcano in Italy light up Sicily's night sky. Scientists say mud pools just a few miles away could help predict what Mount Etna will do next. These mud bubbles are located several miles from Mount Etna in Italy. But scientists think they might hold the key to predicting what Europe's tallest active volcano might do next. The Salinelle mud pools located in the town of Paterno are created when magmatic gas, mostly carbon dioxide, mixes with methane from underground hydrocarbon reservoirs, bringing water and mud to the surface. Volcanoologists like Salvatore Giamanco see the mud pools as a window into Etna's activity. Those are real mud volcanoes where highly salty water, more concentrated than seawater, is emitted together with gas, which is bubbling right in the centre of the vent. Fountains of lava from Mount Etna have been regularly lighting up the Sicilian night sky since December and the current cycle of eruptions has so far posed no risk to the human settlements that surround it, just like the other 200 or so that the mountain has produced since 1998. But Geomanco wants to leave as little to chance as possible, should that change. He says the very first hints of an eruption could be in the mud pools. When magmatic gas increases, it's clear that something new is about to happen on, on Mount Etna. And more important, the fluids emitted here become warmer. The temperature that we normally measure is actually the ambient temperature. But during stronger eruptions of mud, the temperature rises up to almost 50 degrees Celsius. Giamanco is expecting Mount Etna to rumble on for several more months before returning to a more dormant state. 
Meanwhile, he'll be keeping a close eye on the mud. Conservationists in Ukraine are fighting to save the European bison, the continent's largest land mammal. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. A unique animal is starting to make a comeback in Europe. Once widespread across the continent several centuries ago, the European bison was overhunted and its numbers declined dramatically. With no natural enemy due to its size and strength, humans were responsible for its decline. The species was considered extinct in the wild up to 1923. That's when the International Society for the Protection of Bison was formed. The organization found just over 50 of the animals in zoos around the world and launched efforts to reintroduce the animals back into the wild. Today, between 350 and 400 European bison roam the wilds of Ukraine. European bison managed to survive in this country only thanks to a few individuals who preserved the animal despite the fact that this is highly unprofitable and problematic. Due to a lack of infrastructure and organized national parks, Ukraine is one of the few countries on the continent where the animals live in the wild. A special project was launched this March, supported by the World Wildlife Fund and Ukrainian forest workers. Tracking collars were fitted on two European bison during an organized operation in late February. The devices help conservationists gain data on the location and well-being of the animals. And that data will help scientists learn more about them and their daily routine. We see that the numbers are dynamically growing. So we have the grounds to hope that both the mountain and the plain European bison will continue growing in numbers. Last December, the International Union for Conservation of Nature said the European bison was making gains, more than tripling its population since 2003 to more than 6,200 in 2019. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.